the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, um, starting on this side. The American Civil War brought two opposing views of freedom into direct and violent conflict, and nowhere more so than in Kentucky. Kentucky was deeply divided over the issues of slavery and secession. Confederate sentiments were as strong in some regions of the state as were Union sentiments in others, dividing communities and even families. In Louisville, the wealthiest merchants supported the Confederate cause, while the professional class, small business owners, and common laborers tended to support the Union. So the Confederate cause were the wealthiest merchants, the richest people, the 1%. The 1% were the ones that were wanting to control and keep slavery and have free labor. Still, after flirting with the policy of neutrality, Kentucky ultimately remained in the Union and contributed between 90,000 and 100,000 men to the Union Army and between 25,000 and 40,000 to the Confederacy. So, uh, at least twice as many Kentuckians fought for Abraham Lincoln. Because of its location on the Ohio River and as the northern terminus of the LN Railroad, Louisville became a central base of Union operations for the Western Theater of the War and as many as 100,000 Union troops were stationed in or near the city at one time or another. For the same strategic reasons, the Confederates attempted to invade Kentucky, destroy the railroad, and capture Louisville several times in the first year of the war. After, after the Battle of Perryville fought October 8, 1862, near Danville, the Confederate Army never threatened Kentucky again. As a Union slave state, the Emancipation Proclamation 1863 did not apply to Kentucky. However, the military strategy of ending slavery in the Confederate states became the national policy of abolishing slavery altogether. The steady stream of fugitive slaves flowing into the state became a raging flood, and the authority of the army when exercised to protect these fugitives undermined the authority of slave owners, and the institution slowly melted away in Kentucky. For example, in 1860, the value of enslaved African Americans in Kentucky was 107.5 million. By 1865, the value of those who remained enslaved was only $7.2 million. So the value of slaves went down since there were no more slaves to speak of. For many white Kentuckians opposed to emancipation, this policy shift regarding slavery created regarding slavery created a dilemma without an exit and left great bitterness in its wake, which explains the familiar observation that Kentucky did not join the Confederacy until after the Civil War. Despite divisions among whites, African Americans in Kentucky were clearly not divided in their sympathies during the Civil War. In the early months of the conflicts, African Americans in Louisville were treated roughly by the Home Guard and the free black schools and churches were closed. Were treated roughly by the Home Guard and free black schools and churches were closed. Many free people of color fled the city to avoid being pressed into labor gangs, building defensive fortifications and performing other menial tasks. As Union troops streamed into Louisville, African Americans found protection under the aegis of an authority higher than that of local leaders. Thereafter, thousands of fugitive slaves fled to the city, and by July 1864, over 100 blacks were enlisting in the Union Army each day at the Taylor Barracks at 3rd and Oak Streets. These men became the backbone of several regiments of U.S. colored troops, 107th, 108th, 109th, 122nd, 123rd, and 125th U.S. colored infantry. Their families and other freedmen were housed in a 10-acre refugee camp located at 18th, located at 18th and Broadway, then the outskirts of the city. And beginning in 1864, under the supervision of Reverend Thomas James, an African-American minister from Rochester, New York, then all roughly 24,000 black Kentuckians served in the Union Army in arms way, both on the battlefield and from hostile whites and Confederate guerrillas throughout Kentucky. The presence of a large contingent of black soldiers and refugees and a pre-existing free black community made the Civil War experience in Louisville both complex and unique. In this unusual setting, local black churches, organized soldiers, aid societies and free blacks in New Albany, Indiana, even established a hospital de Afrique, 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 to minister the sick and wounded as a definitive expression of the sentiments of Luva African Americans. In January 1865, 22-year-old Mary Lewis presented a battle flag sewn by the Louisville Colored Lady Soldiers Aid Society to the 123rd United States Colored Infantry and stated proudly, soldiers of the 123rd Regiment, you have enlisted in the service of a cause which is that of freedom, not only in this country, but throughout the world. The freedom of your race no less depends upon the endurance of the Republic than the rights and liberties of other races. Its cause, therefore, is your own. Okay. And then here you got the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad Freedom Park marker, which was from mid-1800s to, uh, to the Civil War.
Enslaved African Americans cannot free themselves under American law. An African American might be set free by his or her owner or might be emancipated by governmental action, neither of which was likely, or an enslaved African American might seize freedom through revolt or flight. Slave revolt was ultimately suicidal since whites outnumbered enslaved African Americans by two to one in the slave states. Consequently, fleeing slavery despite its obvious dangers and the possibility of recapture was the best alternative available to those African Americans determined to be free. After the American Revolution, state laws permitted and the U.S. Constitution protected slavery in the southern states while the institution was dying elsewhere in the country, creating a border within the United States with slavery legal on one side and illegal on the other. The goal of slaveholders and slave catchers was to defend that border. The goal of fugitive slaves was to reach and cross it, need, need be the border with Canada or Mexico or the Caribbean as well. Driven by the hunger for freedom, thousands of enslaved African Americans chose this path from a trickle in the 1600s to a steady stream of over 3,000 per year in the 1850s. Most escaped without any help and depend entirely on their own ingenuity and courage. Those who received assistance did so from free people of color, Native Americans and white Americans who comprised a loosely organized conspiracy of conscious uh, known as the Underground Railroad with its shadowy host of agents, conductors, and station keepers. Because the 1793 and later 1850 Fugitive Slave Acts criminalized any assistance to fugitive slaves, true friends of the fugitives stood not only for freedom but for the possibility of multiracial democracy in the United States. For these reasons, the Underground Railroad stands even today as one of the most powerful and sustained multiracial human rights movements in American and world history. The other side. Given the political and physical geography of American slavery, Kentucky as a key border state in the Trans-Appalachian West became central to the Underground Railroad and the Ohio River became a veritable River Jordan for black freedom seekers. As both slave population and culti cotton cultivation shifted steadily to the Southwest after 1850, escape from Kentucky became more common and escape through Kentucky became the best route available to fugitive slaves from Tennessee and Point South. For the same reasons, Louisville became one of the busiest fugitive slave stations and crossing points in the country. With the largest free black community in K Kentucky and with smaller free black settlements in southern Indiana, fugitive slaves could find both refuge from the slave catchers and help in crossing the river. Although clandestine river crossings were possible at or near the numerous ferries and small settlements along the river, by the 1850s the most important, important crossing point in the greater Louisville area was located west of Portland leading from Louisville across the Ohio River to New Albany, Indiana. After negotiating a river crossing, fugitive slaves could follow several routes leading from New Albany and or Jefferson to Salem or an alternative, alternative underground railroad station, then northward from, with the assistance of white friends of the fugitive, many of whom were Quakers by the 1850s. Local newspapers reported an average of one slave escape per day. Of necessity, the underground railroad in the slave state was truly underground and few of its white key, key leaders have been identified clearly far better documented are the roles played by many leaders of the free black community of Louisville among them James C. Cunningham a local black orchestra leader worked on riverboats and smuggled abolitionist literature into the city by hiding it in his sheet music Washington Sprouting was remembered as a shrewd negro and the key local leader by former fugitive slaves in the 1890s Shelton Morris after moving to Cincinnati worked with Levi Coffin in the 1850s, it was considered the most careful operator in that community. There he was involved in efforts to help Margaret Garner, the fugitive slave woman who in 1856 killed her own child rather than see it return to slavery. That was later immortalized in Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved. So, um, that's, that's the end of the Freedom Park, the U of L. The writings. They were talking about the 1850s. It's made me think about 1855 when there were riots against the Germans and the Irish. So you had you know a big slave debate, and then also the Irish and Germans were getting attacked too. So it seems like some of the white people weren't white enough, and there was only a core of the whitest of whites. And the whitest of whites were like the Puritans, the Puritans, and the uh, Anglo-Saxon English people, the Protestants, the Baptists and uh, the non-Catholics, the non-Germans, and the non-Irish is who was, uh, were the main white perpetrators. So I wonder how many of the WASP still exist in Louisville and Kentucky and America today. So, Jonathan Masters, peace out Louisville. Viva la Revolucion.